just want to thank you all for joining the Calgary SPE section, the Young Professionals, for this webinar with Ever Technologies, a game changer for the renewable power market. We appreciate that you're joining us virtually, whether from Calgary or internationally, as SPE Calgary expands on a more digital platform. A thank you to our sponsor, Ovintiv for their continued support of our technical programs. My name is Jennifer G, and I am part of the programs team with the Young Professionals, and I'll be facilitating this webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today our speaker, Matt Taves with Ever Technologies. So Matt is a professional engineer with over a decade of experience in production and operations with a focus on management and technology development, fueled by a passion for new ventures and developing projects from the ground up. Matt has produced an extensive portfolio of pilot projects with a successful track record of creating value through technology commercialization. During his tenure at Synovus Energy, Matt led a team accountable for wellbore design and optimization with Synovus's thermal assets. Matt graduated with distinction from the University of Calgary in oil and gas engineering. So thank you to Matt for joining us today. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so I'll share my screen and we'll get going here. So um, today I just wanted to um, give a bit of, I was looking through the attendee list. I, I think I know uh, a few of you. Um, so I just want to give a bit of a company over to um, technology, what we targeting, and what's our business plan. And um, and uh, there's about uh, there's a lot of people on the line. So rather than uh, I don't think you can uh, interrupt and ask questions, but I'll answer whatever question you put in the Q and A. The talk should only be about 20 minutes, 25 minutes of uh, deck. Um, so, you know, ever we started in uh, late 2017, uh, founded, um, still majority owned by the management team and, and our key uh, directors. Um, we raised about 40 million Canadian to date. And all of that is aimed at becoming you know, our goal is to become the world's leading geothermal energy company and to do that by making geothermal scalable. And I'll get into what I mean by scalable, but, but uh, really we want to make geothermal rather than a niche energy source as it is today. We want to make it a massive, globally scalable, uh, ubiquitous energy source like wind or like solar. Um, and uh, we did a lot of research and development, um, spent a lot of time finding out where we could deploy this technology, what the markets were like, um, hired a big uh, business development team, and we did a lot of lab work and you know computer simulations and engineering work. In uh, 2019, we went to a field scale demonstration, we call that Everlight, and uh, we did that near Rocky Mountain House or kind of by Sylvan Lake in Alberta and executed that in 2019 successfully. And in 2020 is, um, is focusing on commercialization and developing our kind of second and third generation technology, which we call, you know, probably, you know, uncreatively Everloop 2.0 and Everloop 3.0. And that's where my job as the CTO of the firm that's where I'm really focused on is on the kind of technology front and developing that, uh, managing that R&D program and really working on how do we apply this technology to commercial projects. Just go forward from here. So, you know, what, if you look at the competitive market or the competitive landscape for power and for energy solutions. Um, there's kind of th three key categories or three key things that end users want in their energy. They want something that's clean. In other words, nowadays that means uh, primarily not emitting CO2, but it also means you know low water, loose, water use, no emissions, small footprint, just generally environmentally friendly. Um, that's scalable, that doesn't have 
a lot of risk associated to it that can be placed next to the end user, not in some remote location far and far away from the demand. Um, and they want something that can be built at the, the scale that's required, whether that's 10 megawatts or a thousand megawatts, you need to find something that, um, you know, that can fit that requirement. And then the last one, of course, is baseload or dispatchable energy. And really, I think in Calgary, everybody's familiar about that and, and the um, you know, importance of having energy on demand, like fossil fuels. But in many markets, you know, a lot of people still think that you know, wind and solar can solve everything. But as intermittent power sources, they, can't, uh, they can only provide a small fraction of the energy use required. And so we have ourselves in, in a unique category um where we hit all three we're scalable um clean and dispatchable and based on um, you got the alternatives you know wind solar you couple even if you couple them with with storage and the cost of lithium-ion batteries is coming down but even if you ex extrapolate that and you use the most aggressive assumptions it's not going to solve the problem of wind and solar so those those products are clean they're scalable uh, but they can't provide on demand or, or dispatchable energy. Um, of course, fossil fuels and, and um, nuclear are great energy sources, but they're not viewed and they are not uh, clean. And in nuclear's case, although producing no CO2, there's other side effects. Um, and then, you know, you can have hydro or traditional geothermal. Um, now, the challenge with those sources is that, you know, there's not a river. There's not a river or a valley to flood everywhere in the world. It's really not scalable. You have to find a very rare, geographically rare um, location, and it's limited by the size of the resource. And in traditional geothermal sense, that's the primary reason why geothermal today is a very niche energy source. So how do we differ from traditional geothermal? I always have to go through this slide because there's always a lot of confusion. So on the left, you have, uh, you know, what what is the you know, current state of the art in geothermal systems. And that's where you find a hot aquifer or a hydrothermal source, uh, very similar to old school oil and gas exploration as an analogy. So you shoot seismic, you drill delineation wells, you work up a resource, um, you drill some more wells, you build a, a custom build kind of reservoir model that seeks to describe the reservoir. You figure out how much uh, hot water that's going to produce over a, a lifetime. Then you custom build a plant specifically to that um, location. Then you start the whole thing up and you find there's a lot of uncertainty in performance just due to the inherent uncertainty in geology. And this is um, this is the state of the art and it's a um, it, it's great if you can find a great resource, these are good projects. The problem is that they're rare, few, far between, and they take a really long time to develop. Um, here, what it is, is it's really just a radiator in the ground or a subsurface heat exchanger. So there's no flow in or out of the closed loop multilateral system. Um, we just circulate a working fluid using the natural geothermal gradient of the earth. And um, unlike traditional geothermal, that's not dependent on permeability. We don't need an aquifer, we don't need an aquifer source. This theoretically will work in any rock as long as um, it's hot rocket and the earth is always gets hotter as you go deeper um, the gradient in a place like Alberta 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer but in say the western US that's about 60 degrees per kilometer in most places and uh, it can get even higher than that in in some other areas um, and so we're just tapping into that natural geothermal gradient and using pure conductive heat transfer rather than convective heat transfer as the traditional sense. So that's the primary difference is that it's a closed system that uses conductive heat transfer. So all of the advantages come from that kind of initial simple concept. Um, one is that it's driven by a thermal siphon. So there's no pump required. There's no ESP, there's no surface pump, there's uh, no energy input required. Um, fluid goes down cold on the inlet well comes up hot on the other well, and that's circulated. And that creates a density difference or a, uh, a difference in hydrostatic head. And that uh, is a fixed drive, completely power the fluid circulating 
you know, there's no fraction, obviously, being the closest, no induced side density. And this is a really, really critical differentiator. In almost all the markets, except for um, remote areas of Western US and a place like Alberta, but in every other market we work in, basically you cannot frack. You cannot, especially close to population centers, it really is a kind of red line that uh, can kill project in its tracks. Um, no GHG, of course, um, no water. You just fill the system up day one and circulate the water. There's no production treatment, no corrosion, no erosion, no scaling, no reinjection problems on the injection well. These are all typical um, issues with traditional geothermal. And in fact, if you look at the top, uh, say four or five operating costs associated with traditional geothermal in, uh, in level of importance, for at least for a low enthalpy system, it would be um, the parasitic power required to run the downhole ESPs. It would be the um, maintenance on those pumps because these are very, very high flow rate wells. Uh, you know, we're talking about 50,000 barrels a day of water. Um, then it would be the uh, corrosion and brine treatment associated with um, cleaning up the produced brine and running it through a heat exchanger, so managing scale, managing erosion, managing corrosion. Then it would be working over reinjection wells um, that are typical, even in, you know, in oil and gas, if anyone's worked on reinjection wells, they're constantly getting plugged. It's no different in traditional geothermal. So those would be the, say, the top four operating costs, which we completely eliminate in the end. So it's, it's a simple concept. It's a really simple system. There's no moving parts, and it's very predictable, which is, how the, the business plan is constructed um, to, to uh, you know, develop this resource play. Um, it would be analogous to say oil and gas resource plays where you can cookie cutter, standardized, manufactured product um, with huge pad drilling, economies of scale, factory drilling, and, um, and have a really high predictability on the output. So that, that's kind of a high level of the introduction to the technology um, and uh, introduction to, to how it's different from the status quo. So what have we done? Well, I mentioned we did a bunch of uh, lab work. We did a bunch of simulation work. Uh, last year, we built an, the Everlight. So the Everlight pilot located by Rocky Mountain House consists of an in the well, uh, uh, outlet well 2.45 kilometers to the north and um, two multilaterals down close to the multilateral or multilateral ever loop. We only had to do two laterals in this because a commercial project would have say 10 but they would all be identical to these to the first two they're all the same it's just more of them so in terms of a full-scale um, demonstrator this was the cheapest and most efficient way to, to get it done. Um, there's a pipeline connecting the two wells, and um, it's 2.5 kilometers from site to site and about 2.4 kilometers deep. Um, and we spent about $10 million. So what was that money for? Well, this isn't producing any commercial quantities of heat or electricity. It's purely to de-risk and demonstrate some of the key technical uncertainties. And those are very well defined. Um, after talking to some of our end users and, and partners around the world, it's really to drill and the intersection and connection of an Everloop using two rigs in a multilateral scenario. Um, sealing and the multilaterals and junctions and pressure testing them with uh, what we call rock pipe completion technology, which is our proprietary method to seal these rigs without um, casing. And then to demonstrate the thermal siphon and validate the thermal dynamics. And put that in perspective, you know, the whole business plan relies on us being able to reduce the revenue risk. In other words, before spending any money, we can predict very accurately how much thermal output an Everloop will produce. And typically, these projects always have a fixed PPA or, or power purchase agreement or offtake agreement. And so you have a fixed price for 20 plus years and you've got very, very flat, predictable output for 30 years. And that means that the revenue stream from one of these projects is really like a financial asset. It's a 
it's a bankable um, commodity that lets you uh, finance these projects and build them um, in with much faster speed. So rather than having you know five to five to eight year development timeline is tradition is uh, typical for traditional geothermal. Honestly, it can be like I've seen projects that take fifteen years to develop from the first wells being drilled. Um, uh, this Everloop type of technology takes eighteen months because there's none of that exploration, delineation, and risk capital phase. Maybe I won't talk while I'm playing this one. Yeah, so that video there shows um, shows a drone flyover from the South Well at our Everlight demonstration facility. This is August 2019, flying over to the North Well. And um, those levels at about the halfway point. So here's a few images uh, from uh, demonstration. Here's a rig crew celebrating um, the intersection early in the morning in uh, fall last year and you can see the rig in the in the distance there the second rig so we drilled and intersected those well bores we had full mechanical confirmation um we completed it. so there's three uh three objectives and we checked off all of them um and i kind of skipped over but what's this rock pipe completion system well that we, we case and cement uh, casing through to the intermediate casing point landed at about 90 degrees. That's totally standard, totally traditional as in any you know oil and gas well. It's the multilaterals where we are actually using a chemical sealant rather than casing them uh, in the target zone. And uh, that's what we call the rock pipe system. So we, we did the intersection, we did the rock pipe completion, pressure tested that, and then um, we took six months to validate the thermodynamics and the modeling um, simulation work around how we predict performance over a 30 year life. It's a really important part because uh, it can be predict and finance commercial projects. So, on the drilling side, um, you know, this shows uh, these curves, this shows um, depth and uh, cost on the y axis and days from uh, the x axis. So, you focus on the red lines you can see that uh, budget is in dotted uh, dash line and actuals are in the solid line so for both well bores we were basically bang on with budget um, after uh, 30 plus days of drilling um, and what we're really doing here this this business plan relies on leveraging oil and gas technology and particularly leveraging massive kind of step change in drilling speed that's happened in the last five years so this is data um, from um, Lazard for wind and solar and from Canada for uh, drilling time. And it's all normalized to 100 for 2013. And you can see the decline in costs or the um, reduced uh, decline in drilling time. Or in other words, the increase in drilling speed in uh, the last several years. And what's really striking is there's a lot of press about how wind and solar are getting much much cheaper but in fact they're actually very mature technologies if you look at their whole decline curve going back a decade they have a really really sharp steep um, decline 10 years ago and it's all flattening off now as you can see and that's just a standard learning curve that you got you can see that for any technology whether it's car tires or cell phones or any kind of widget that's a manufactured product you'll see that same exponential decline in cost or learning curve. And drilling is going through that right now. And that's really what we're leveraging uh, and applying to a new. In so here's uh, uh, just a few more images. Um, this is the facility December 3rd, 2019. So we commissioned that, switched it to thermosiphon mode on December 4th. And we've been operating on thermosiphon mode ever since. Um, and uh, Here's just a control screen. Um, you, again, pretty simple system, pipeline and surface, control valves and um, 
instrumentation and a, um, there's an aerial cooler that rejects the heat and approximates the heat duty um, at the northern site. So in a commercial operation, of course, that heat exchanger is actually transferring heat from our Everloop working fluid to an organic Rankine cycle, heat to power unit, or to a district heating end user. But in this test, we just transferring that to an aerial cooler. Um, and we all um, placed in the outer wall. So on the thermodynamics, um, you know, this is only actually a couple months of data, but it's been uh, updated for the full six months. And actually even using just the uh, first couple months of data and then forecasting those six months, it's a bang on match, uh, less than 2% error between the actuals and the simulated performance. And this shows the outlet temperature over time. And one of the key things that you have to um, get right the design of these systems is the interference between the adjacent multilaterals. So this little video here shows the heat extraction and, and looking at a cross section, this is two well bores going into the screen. Uh, and you can see the heat extraction increasing over time. And eventually that increase this um, thermal transient eventually interacts with the adjacent thermal transient from the adjacent wellbore. And then you get to have uh, some decline when that happens. And so it's important that you place and then you directionally plan these wellbores properly to manage uh, that we designed for essentially no, uh, no decline over a 30 year life or no, no wellbore interference, negligible wellbore interference over a 30 year life. And, and that's very, very similar like when you look at the math behind that, it's like a pressure transient. So if you think about common reservoir engineering, um, you start producing from well, there's a pressure transient that moves away from that well bore. And um, eventually that interacts with adjacent well bores and then you can see increased decline. So it's the same concept, but this is a thermal transient uh, with conductive heat transfer. So that's, that's Everloop 1.0. That's our baseline technology. That's what we demonstrated last year. That's what we're commercializing right now in some of our high-end, our early entry markets. Um, you know, small footprint, thermocycling driven. Um, we we have a custom design working through it in there. We use rock pipe in the multilaterals. That really drives the capital efficiency, and it's pure conductive heat transfer versus convection, uh, which is a standard traditional system. And so I'll just uh, move on to a uh, kind of technology roadmap that's beyond what I just talked about, that's beyond um, the 1.0 uh, and where we're currently commercializing. So we've got a very defined um, suite of technologies that we're spending money on and really in an active uh, research and development program um, right now. And um, so experience in this chart here, um, I start off with uh, the y-axis here. This is LCOE or levelized cost of electricity. For those familiar with oil and gas, that's supply cost. So that's the break-even price of electricity that you have to sell the power out to make a project uh, have a break-even radio charge. And this is a metric that's commonly used in the industry to evaluate and compare different technologies for different projects. Um, but basically supply costs. Um, and so on on the X axis, you can see over the 1.0, 2.0, and, and onwards. And these are some different technology iterations that we're working on. Um, I'll start with, uh, you know, every 4.0, what is that? That's actually no new technology. That's just a custom design rig that's purpose built to drill Everloop. And it's actually a dual derrick rig. So that's a rig that has, um, you know, it's a single rig, but it has two derricks and it drills both the Everloop Inlet well and the Everloop Outlet well at the exact same time. And there's a bunch of economies of scale and efficiencies associated with that. You can see the impact it makes on the LCU. There's really not any new technology there. It's, it's applying um, existing technology in a manufactured economy of scale way to this application. Um, what we're working on right now and uh, that we're demonstrating in 2020 and we're actively testing on bench scale on lab scale and in field scale uh, in france norway and nevada is uh, ever 2.0 and ever 
three format. And I was 1.0, this is everything that we talked about on the previous few slides that you know we consider that proven. Um, so you can see the power price there, break even power price $150 roughly per megawatt hour. Of course, that depends on the project and depends on the location and jurisdiction and so on. But you know, for a um, high level view, on $150 per megawatt hour. That is not competitive today in a place like Alberta or in most of North American grids. But that is competitive in certain high price energy markets that have uh, high cost energy. And that's uh, a lot of Europe. Um, that's for district heating or direct heat use projects. Um, anywhere where there's diesel used as the uh, alternate power source, so places like the Yukon in northern Canada or island markets or essentially the communities, um, uh, with that. Um, they're not uh, island, but they want, to be, they want to act like an island. Um, and so we, we are working on a bunch of those as well. So that point oh, no, does make money today. It is economic today, and that's our early in our or high-end market, and um, and then uh, as we go down this technology curve, and as we develop these different iterations, we're going to break into lower and lower price markets. And eventually, down here, you can break into the you know, global grid-scale market, which is trillion, but it's multi-trillion-dollar uh, market scale. Yeah, so I mentioned that the testing program, this is just some of the images of uh, some of the work we're doing with some partners. Uh, we have a $7 million three-year agreement with U of T. Um, we're doing a lot of bench scale work, a lot of lab work. Uh, and um, and this is a, a test rig that we're currently uh, dealing with in Norway. And um, so, so we kind of have the multi-stage iterative testing plus we're, we're uh, really interested in failing quickly collecting data as fast as possible and learning from that and then iterating it and improving and repeating so uh, everything we do is it's always about speed it's always about how fast uh, get that into the field and test it um, and we have the uh, i mentioned yeah we're doing some, some tests around a whole bunch of different locations a bunch of reasons for that um, but um, we are you know we're a global company in that we're headquartered in Calgary but we have people and offices in, in a bunch of different countries around the world and we have the ability to execute projects uh, in a lot of different areas um, and all of this is gearing up all this kind of iterative testing um, that we're doing right now is gearing up for a commercial scale demonstration of, of what uh, I call Everly 2.0 plus, so 2.0 and 3.0 technology in Nevada um, as early as, as later this year. Uh, that might slip into early 2021. Um, but um, that's what we're gearing up for is a commercial scale demonstration, like Everlight, but of the uh, second generation technology. So this looks similar to the technology roadmap that you've seen earlier. Um, this chart shows uh, how we're going to market and the business plan. Um, again, same thing here on the y-axis, you see the levelized electricity price or LPOE. Um, on the uh, x-axis, of course, time. And these two, the screen curve is at a gradient of roughly 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And the orange curve is at 60 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And um, this is showing the price where we can deliver projects out over time. And right now, where we're at the very top end of this learning curve, where we have yet to build a commercial scale project. And um, it's the most expensive one, obviously, and it's the highest risk and the most difficult <coughs> to finance. We're focused on these high end niche markets like Germany or Netherlands or Japan or, or some places in Miami, where there's really high prices. Many times it's a feed in tariff and uh, the alternates are high priced as well and where we can make money uh, today. We get on this learning curve and we come down and over time we're breaking into different markets. Here's the island markets I was talking about. Uh, in North America, there's a large corporate or behind the fence market. 
and um, and that's where um, you know an example of that is in military bases, or another example is um, in industrial users that pay um, retail prices rather than wholesale prices. Um, then there's the uh, grid balancing market, um, and that um, you know. To put it in perspective, um, in a place like California, a solar plant, wholesale solar plant gets paid maybe $30, maybe $20 per megawatt hour for that solar plant. But if you're living in LA or you're living in the uh, Silicon Valley somewhere, you're paying like $150 um, per megawatt hour. So there's this huge, massive difference between the price it takes to generate electricity and the price that the end user is paying. And most of that value is going to grid balancing. So transmission goods, storage, um, distribution, and all of the um, infrastructure required to take intermittent power sources and integrate them into the grid and balance them with equivalent amount of backup fossil fuel power, for example. And um, so if you can provide, like our product says, a dispatchable source, um, there's a premium to be uh, paid for that, and that's what the grid balancing market for it. And then ultimately, we're going to compete on massive scale in the wholesale grid market, but that's years away. So the price point to get that is very, very uh, low, and, um, and it's going to take some time to get there. So, What's driving these learning curves? Well, obviously, we talked about technology, we saw technology roadmap, but the other things that are driving is just the generic uh, experience curve or learning curve that's associated with every repetitive standardized technology that you just repeat over and over. And then there's as well economies of scale. So as you scale up to bigger and bigger projects, and um, there is a kind of independent effect that's independent of the learning curve, independent of the technology, and that's just being able to get efficiencies through economies of scale strategic sourcing and other um, in other words. So we have a we have a huge sales pipeline of projects, um, over 50 and counting, and uh, combined they add up to a massive multi-billion dollar opportunity. And uh, we're hoping to grow that to over 100 projects by the end of the year. And this is an example of, of one project. It's a project in the town of Gertrude in southern Germany in Bavaria. Um, the background is that there is a, a company, Enix, who we partnered with. Um, they went and drilled, and this is shown an image of, of them drilling in 2017. They drilled two dry geothermal wells, traditional geothermal wells. What that means is, and this is very common, and you explore, you're looking for an aquifer, you're looking for a hydrothermal source, you drill down. Up, but there's no there's no permeability, there's no flow capacity. That's what's called a dry well. You know, no different than oil and gas. Uh, although in resource plays, you know, the definitions kind of become irrelevant. And um, and so we a lot of our projects are like this one, where there's a failed traditional geothermal project, but a lot of the infrastructure is in place, the environmental approvals. You know, in this case, there are drilling pads available, there is electricity you know, pipeline, like everything available to Tennessee. So we can come in there and accelerate it um, and take over um, what, what is a failed project and turn it into a successful project. This shows kind of just a heating network going out through town of Bear Three. This is a combined heat and power uh, project, so electricity plus district heating for the town. And um, and we're looking at this lease outlined in red and developing that over 10 years with massive pad scale development, you know, dozens and dozens of others and um, we're scaling that up to over um, 200 megawatts. And to summary some of the other projects we have in, in uh, some key jurisdictions and the you know, number of projects, what technology is required and you can see Again, you know, the price in the U.S. is low. There's no project where we're looking at in the U.S. right now where we have uh, where we can make uh, good money with the ability one point technology. It requires 2.0 plus. And this kind of summarizes, you know, the number of ability that we can uh, feasible to drill in this current project. 
Okay. So that's so I had. Um, and I will uh, see if I can answer questions. Thanks, Matt. Uh, you've obviously outlined quite the, the development and growth over the, the next five, 10, 30 years. Oh, getting feedback from your end. Oh, yeah, so you've yeah. obviously outlined a lot of um, development opportunities. And so we'll start diving into some of the questions here. One of them that was just recently asked, what do you feel is Ever's biggest hurdle to further developing the technology and scale of, of the company? Is it, is it on the funding side, uh, power purchase agreements, R&D? Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so the biggest, the biggest hurdle is um, we've actually been very, very successful raising money into uh, the technology firm, which is the company that I work for, Ever Technology Day. And, um, and uh, we're actually just doing a, a, a another round right now, and we're having a lot of success. And uh, we just raised $11 million, I think about a month and a half ago, right in the middle of the COVID, uh, you know, panic, I would call it. And, um, and so it's actually, it hasn't been an issue raising money for the technology play, but those investors are looking for technology rates of returns. Our biggest challenge is getting commercial projects funded. So the commercial project is an infrastructure class asset, and it's actually not funded by 100% um, by ever. That's where we need to bring in joint venture uh, partners. And those projects have more typical infrastructure rates of returns that you would see for uh, renewable power projects like wind or solar. And we can beat those returns a little bit. Perception is this has never been done before. So there's, there is a risk premium as well. So the biggest challenge we have is financing the first few um, commercial projects. Um, okay. But we, we feel pretty confident we can, we can get that done. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal given given this market and environment is the legislative legislative uh outlook internationally easier to get these projects approved do you feel um yeah there's there's two sides to that story so if you want to drill um if you want to get a drilling approval and drill a well the best place in the world to do it is Alberta um, or maybe Texas or something. But, um, you know, to give it, put that in perspective, it took us 48 hours to get approval to drill uh, Everlight. Whereas in a jurisdiction like Netherlands or Germany where we're active, that process is like six months to a year. So it's way, way more drawn out. But the advantage that those jurisdictions have is on incentivizing um, incentivizing the industrial scale of renewable energy. So in Canada, one of the drawbacks that we have in Canada is that there are some funding programs that, but they're for seeding, and we, we participate in those and, and are grateful for those, but those are for seeding technology. They're not for commercializing technology. Um, and then you look at a place like Alberta, the Alberta power market is deregulated and there's no incentive there's no difference in value to produce uh, clean dispatchable power versus fossil fuel power versus, um, there is a, a program which is called REP and that's only for wind and solar, um, which does provide a long-term uh, price. So that's what the jurisdictions like Netherlands, like Germany do that really incentivizes commercial projects is that they provide a fixed, clear, long-term price for geothermal power or geothermal heat. Um, and that's the kind of ingredient that is missing in much of North America. And that's why it makes the project so attractive to do there. Mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully North America makes some changes then. I'll, I'll jump into yeah. some more of the technical questions here. Uh, I think just one of the general questions that was asked was what was the working fluid that was used when you were comparing the traditional geothermal system, which uses uh, water to the ever loop. Is that something yeah. that you can discuss? 
Yeah, on the working flues, we kind of also have a technology roadmap on those, um, and they can get to be you know, pretty exquisite and complicated chemistry. But right now, the working fluid is basically a slick water, if you're familiar with slick water fracturing. So it's essentially a designer water. It has drag reducing agents, it has biocide, it has corrosion inhibitor, it has some wellbore integrity additives, it has uh, um, some additives to maintain the rock pipe, uh, but it's essentially 99% water. So really applying the application of the, the shale gas development uh, technologies with yep. Adler. That's yeah, great. that one that one's borrowed, borrowed a lot from, uh, from the oil and gas industry. And then there was a couple of questions about whether the wells are cased on uh, both ends and how they're connected downhole. Um, yeah, so the casing goes down to the intermediate casing point. So it's cased, you know, fully cased and cemented, exactly the same as a standard oil and gas well, up through the vertical and uh, through the build and turn and, and landed at 90 degrees. Um, and beyond, beyond that, the horizontal multilaterals, those are all drilled open hole and sealed um, with the rock pipe chemical sealant. Interesting. With, uh, with the fluid, um, this, this participant asked if you could use a supercritical CO2 as the fluid in the system, if that would and de develop the, the carbon capture utilization strategy better. Um, definitely, definitely that works. We, you know, actually that's where we started, you know, back in 2017, that's where we started looking at different working fluids and doing a lot of modeling on different types of fluids, different types of supercritical fluids. Um, and what we found is that there is an advantage and definitely you can have a um, thermodynamic advantage, um, but it's not that big. It's not, um, you know, it's say five to 20%. So it, it is definitely a big advantage, but it's a, there's a lot of complications with doing it that way. And given everything else that we're trying to do um, right now, we think the simplest way is to use it by off the shelf organic rankin cycles, develop projects like that, and then work on iterating on uh, different working fluids over time. One of the beauties, beauties of uh, different working fluids is that you can imagine it as a software upgrade. So some of the stuff we're working on, we think, you know, you can go back to whenever that was drilled that's been circulating a water-based working fluid for five years. You can go back to that and simply change out the fluid and get an increased uh, thermal output and increased uh, power output. Do your projects require geo steering through the lateral zone then? And are they based on any geologic properties? Um, gamma we, do do some, we do do some geo steering. Um, you know, we are targeting different types of rock properties. So we're trying to say in the stay in a certain zone that's got competent rock that has um, high thermal conductivity. Mm -hmm. But uh, really a lot of the art is around drilling fast. And um, so we don't want to be, you know, micromanaging placement. We want to be drilling as fast as possible. And then this question has come up a couple of times. It just generally asks, how do we generate electricity with the low grade 60 degree feedstock? Yeah, so um, Everlight has a rock temperature of 80 degrees uh, Celsius and exiting the laterals at Everlight, about 60 degrees, 65 degrees Celsius. Um, and so in our system, you know, we always approach the rock temperature by say 20 degrees. So if the rock temperature is 150, like it is in Germany, we approach that by, um, the, the closest we can approach it is 20 degrees. Um, and uh, the Everlight demonstration was to prove those kind of key technical objectives. It wasn't to demonstrate, um, you know, higher temperature rock or, or industrial or commercial scale temperatures. All of our commercial projects are at deeper depths and higher temperature than what we drilled in Alberta. Same technology, just deeper. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the system is, is viable in a traditional geothermal setting? 
And then a follow up to this question was, how is the aquifer securely uh, security insured? I think that just means the groundwater protected, potentially. Yeah, so um, it depends on the traditional geothermal uh, project, obviously. Um, you know, if traditional geothermal works well at that location, then probably just go do a traditional geothermal project there. If it's a failed project, meaning that it's tight or there's no permeability or insufficient permeability, then that could potentially be a really good Everly project. I mean, we evaluate those on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and um, you know, a lot of our early projects are are like that, where there's uh, you know hot but dry wells, and then um, we can go in and do an Everly there. That, 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 yeah. I would just to say the biggest challenge with this is, you know, technically the beauty about the system is that technically it, it pretty much works everywhere. Economically, you know, you have to look at the site specifics or the project specifics. What's the power price in that area? What's the well cost in that area, et cetera. Yeah, and that was that was the question I was actually just going to ask with the decision process for selecting certain locations over the other ones. So <laughs> you answered it. <laughs> As a, as a general question on uh, the pathway forward for this technology to be cost competitive, do you feel that uh, there can be some sort of uh, combined cycle with potentially natural gas power plants? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Um, in fact, that there's a few projects that we have looked at that do something similar. It, it, it all comes down to, um, yeah, specifics of the project and the economics. And a lot of that's down to the legislation. Like for example, in, uh, in Alberta, there's no, there's no price for uh, geothermal energy, but let's say, you know, there was something that's legislated and there's, you know, some, some fixed or some formula for, or some premium for dispatchable green power. You know, do you get that same price as well as having natural gas peak uh, or uh, natural gas on the uh, to as a boost? Um, and so that's a problem that's facing every jurisdiction because all of these schemes are supposed to be incentivized in CO free CO two free energy. And um, but but it could work definitely. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see how this progresses definitely over the next couple of years. So we're nearing one o'clock and there are still quite a few questions, but I think that I'll end off on, on that one unless, um, Matt, you want to answer any of the other questions that are, are listed there. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to present for the uh, SPE Young Professionals and look forward to continuing the engagement with seeing wherever it goes. Sure, excellent, thanks, thanks for having me. And uh, one of the reasons I, I wanted to come on the call today is, is we are, you know, we're growing and we're constantly hiring and keep your eye out for posting. We're always looking for you know, smart, motivated uh, people that wanna make a difference, so. Fantastic. And I would say to any of the participants that uh, didn't have their questions answered or would like to reach out to Matt, feel free to do so. So thank you again for joining and hope everyone has a good day. Okay, thanks a lot, Jennifer. Thanks everyone. Have a good day.